evening and welcome to the start of our fourth year. As always, we're live and the detectives here from all around the UK are waiting for your call. In 32 programmes over the past three years, Crime Watch viewers have so far helped police to recover almost £2 million worth of property and 101 people have been arrested as a direct result of your calls. Of these, four had charges dropped, 36 are awaiting trial now, one has been acquitted and 60 have so far been convicted. Well, police here in the studio and all over the country are hoping you might recognise something tonight and help solve one of our cases. We have reconstructions of three serious crimes. The strange events surrounding the murder of Wendy Nell at her bedsit in Tunbridge Wells, an armed wages snatch at the station in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, and the long hunt for a man who's been attacking women in their homes in Notting Hill in West London. Before those reconstructions, let's tell you briefly what happened after the last programme in July. Five people faced charges as a result of it. You may remember we showed a security video of a jewellery theft at a shop in St Neots in Cambridgeshire. One viewer recognised something in that video and as a result, a man is now awaiting trial. And within ten minutes of our last programme, detectives had an address for a man wanted in connection with a major fraud involving forged and stolen pension books. At about midnight, soon after the Crime Watch update went off the air, police went to the man's home in Leytonstone, East London, and arrested him. He's now charged with a conspiracy to defraud the DHSS. Three men faced charges after shopkeepers were conned out of hundreds of videotapes. Ironically, two of the gang were caught on video themselves. Nine viewers independently rang in with information, and that led to a man's arrest. As a direct result of the programme, two other men have also been arrested. Less success, I'm afraid to say, on the murder of Christopher Cumley, a jeweller in North London who was shot dead by raiders just two days before he was due to retire from the business. Two viewers rang to say they'd seen the robbers escape, and police say that a law student who recognised events from our reconstruction has provided them with some important new evidence. But other leads from viewers helped police solve unrelated crimes. They've recovered £20,000 worth of jewellery and a shotgun, and arrested 20 drug stealers. And detectives looking for the men responsible for stealing and passing bank drafts now say they have some very promising new leads. We'll let you know as soon as there are any further developments. You might remember we showed a photograph from a British passport left at a bureau de change in Amsterdam. It was of a man police wanted to speak to about the theft of visa travellers' cheques stolen from a house in East London. Well, last Friday he was arrested in Dover and he's been charged with fraud amounting to £180,000. The first of this month's reconstructions tells the story of a 25-year-old woman who lived alone in a bedsit at Tunbridge Wells in Kent. Wendy Nell was murdered there one Monday night in June. What's especially tragic about this case is that several people had seen prowlers in the district, but they hadn't reported them to the police. And there's a mystery about Wendy that maybe you can solve. The date is Monday, June the 22nd. Number 14, Guildford Road, in Tunbridge Wells, that Monday morning. At 8.30, as usual, Wendy Nell left her bedsit for her 15-minute walk to work. Right. All you've got to do is check the prices on them and put them into the calculator. Wendy was manageress of Super Snaps in Camden Road. That Monday, a new assistant had started, and Wendy took her through the routine. Make sure they've got K34 on all of them. And what's that? That's the shop number. Right. Put them in alphabetical order, mm -hmm. and then into the main tray. Wendy was good at her job, and happy there. Friendly and efficient, and popular with all the staff. All right. Call me if you need me. OK, then. Wendy visited a customer, then at about quarter past one, went to her bank and building society. Did she meet anyone else? After work, at six o'clock, Wendy went home to collect some laundry. Her bedsit was tiny and run down. In fact, she disliked it so much, she rarely allowed anyone to visit, and she spent very little time there. When she left, she left the window open. In fact, it wouldn't close because the latch had been painted over there was easy access to the back of her house, which was divided into nine small bedsits. Her ground floor room backed onto a poorly lit alleyway. 
There'd been several nighttime prowlers and peeping toms, and 24 hours earlier, there'd been a strange incident at a house less than 50 yards away. A 19-year-old was alone in her second floor flat on that Sunday evening. You shouldn't leave your window open, especially in the bedroom. This is a Crime Watch video fit of the man, compiled by the witness. By eight o'clock on the Monday evening, Wendy was finishing her washing in the Rastall Laundrette, a couple of miles from her home. Is dead. Wendy's boyfriend, Ian, lived close by with his mother, and for the rest of the evening, the three of them watched TV together. 10.30, back in the alleyway behind Guildford Road. Someone who lived in the same house as Wendy saw a man trying to peep through a window in the house directly opposite. The prowler watched for some minutes before he was disturbed. The police weren't called. Three quarters of an hour later, at 11.15, Wendy was taken home by her boyfriend, Ian. Wendy died from a blow to the head sometime before 5 a.m. Local residents recalled two events that night. At 12.30, a peeping Tom was spotted outside a house in nearby Grove Hill Road. And at 10 past one in Guildford Road, neighbors remember a car, possibly a blue Talbot Horizon, having difficulty starting outside Wendy's house. At 12 o'clock, BBC Radio Kent News with Michael Barr. Police today issued a fresh appeal for witnesses following the murder of the Tunbridge Wells shop manageress Wendy Nell earlier this week. Wendy, who was 25, was found battered to death in her bedsit in Guildford Road. Two days after Wendy's death, a new witness, a local shopkeeper, came forward with evidence which opened a whole new line of inquiry. Bits and Pieces is a second-hand goods shop specialising in collector's items. The owner believes Wendy was a regular visitor. Oh, hello. Hello. Come for your train, then? Yes. Over a period of nine months, Wendy had visited the shop about once a fortnight, always to buy or look at model trains. That'll be four pounds, I think. Thank you very much. How much are those trains up there? Those are green ones. Yes. Yeah. About 20 pounds. Assuming it was Wendy, none of the trains she bought has ever been found. Wendy didn't keep them for herself, so to whom did she give them? Ma'am, in charge of seeking Wendy's killer is Richard Rickson. Was that Wendy? Well, I want to be sure that the customer was Wendy now, and I would appeal to any viewer who recognises herself in that reconstruction to ring us tonight. If it was Wendy, then 
What was she doing with the trains? Who did she buy them for? Where are they now? And she was in the habit of buying carriages, not locomotives. They were all OO gauge, or their continental equivalent. Yes, all trying or Hornby make, and over a period of nine months, she bought perhaps a dozen of them. She purchased this model before, on the Friday before she died. It's a Fleischmann make. It's a German carriage, identical in every respect to this one, apart from the colour. The one she bought was a single colour maroon. Now, I gather that several things are missing from her flat, in particular her diary and her keys. Her diary, of course, would have her name in it, Wendy Nell. The keys are quite uh, distinctive. This, uh, this key ring is, is yes, very uh, odd. The key fob she brought back from a recent holiday in Austria, and we certainly know that the brass Woman of the Year tag was attached to the key ring, as were the two keys you see um, in, in these. Now, was her killer, do you think, someone she knew, or was this an opportunist crime? Do you know? Well, I'm hoping that a telephone call tonight will answer that question for us. The man who went to that woman's house nearby the night before and said, you shouldn't keep your window open. That very odd thing very to do. Very strange We've got a video fit of him. Perhaps you could describe him to us. Yes, that man is um, in his mid-twenties. He's over six foot tall and very thinly built. He's got short, dark hair and a tidy moustache. And that was about half past six on Sunday the 21st. Now, obviously, if that man is entirely innocent of the murder, he would do well to call you and uh, yes, say Yes, he so. would. It's essential that we trace that man. Right. Also, that car, that blue or possibly blue or greyish car that was outside her house about one o'clock on, on that, uh, the morning that she died, again, that might be entirely innocent. Whoever was driving a car away from Guildford Street in Tunbridge Wells that night ought to come forward. Yes, we need to eliminate that. It was a light blue or grey Talbot Horizon. It left Guildford Road. Did anybody see it leaving Guildford Road? Or did you see it arrive near where you live sometime in the early hours of Tuesday, the 23rd of June this year? Superintendent Rickson, thank you very much. Please do call us if you can help. It's terribly important. Call right now. Here's the number, 01811 That's 01811 8055. Or you can dial the incident room at Tunbridge Wells. That's Tunbridge Wells 511055. The code for Tunbridge Wells is 0892 511055. Well, now to incident desk, where the police appeal to you directly. Tonight, jewellery known as Blue John jewellery stolen from shops in Castleton in Derbyshire. A man who conned thousands of pounds in Gloucester and left a trail of unpaid bills across the south. And from Cornwall, the mystery of camping gear found in a field. What's happened to the owner? Here are Constable Helen Phelps and Superintendent David Hatcher. Police in Bristol are now very concerned for the safety of Shirley Banks, who's been missing since Thursday night. Shirley, who's 28, lives in Clifton, Bristol, and she and her husband have only been married a month, and friends and family all say she was very happy. She was last seen on the evening of the 8th, shopping at Debenhams in Bristol. She didn't return, but next day it's thought she phoned Alexandra Workwear, where she's a manager, to say she was ill. We think Shirley had very little cash with her, but she was carrying an access card and a NatWest checkbook. Her orange mini is also missing, registration number HWL 507N. Take another look at her. She's 28, 5 foot 6, slim and blonde. If you've seen Shirley or her car, ring us now. We'll let you know if there are developments. Still in Bristol, an armed robbery at an industrial estate on the outskirts of the city. At midday on Thursday the 10th of September, an armed man burst into Cox's and Sons, a kitchen unit factory on the Avonmouth estate, and took £11,000 from the wages clerk. Witnesses have helped to compile this rather striking video fit. He's in his mid-twenties, between six foot and six foot two, and slim. Notice those little pieces of blue-green cloth knitted into his beard. And we think the dreadlocks might be a disguise, so maybe this makes him look more familiar. He also had a white accomplice, aged 35 to 40, five foot eight tall, with black shoulder-length hair. The robber was spotted earlier in the day in a yellow Datsun Bluebird, like this one. It was parked on the Avonmouth estate in Third Way, just 150 yards from where the robbery took place. Take another look at these two, and if you've seen them, or know them, ring us now. The stone in this jewellery is known as Blue John, and it's only found under one hillside in the Derbyshire village of Castleton. Most of the jewellery is sold by small gift shops in the centre of the village, and over the past three months, three of them have been burgled. 
On the 14th of July, there was a break-in at the Speedwell Cavern shop. Then, less than a month later, the Crook Barn had two small windows broken and everything on the display was scooped up. And just last week, on the 5th of October, burglars smashed through the roof of the Toll Bar gift shop in Cross Street. Altogether, £53,000 worth of jewellery has gone. Now, Blue John is unique to Castleton and is rarely sold elsewhere, so if you've been offered any, call us now. Next, have a look at this man. He conned £14,000 out of a Gloucestershire businessman earlier this year. We know quite a lot about him, except his true identity and his whereabouts. He's 45, about 5 foot 7 and rather fat. He suffers from psoriasis, a flaking skin condition, and his usernames Geoffrey Williams, Geoffrey Martin and James Phillips. We believe he gambles regularly. He's an accomplished blackjack player and usually drinks Bacardi and Coke. Over the past few months, he's been seen across the south, from Portsmouth to Rochester, Kent, sometimes staying in hotels and leaving without paying the bill. He may have been travelling in a beige Vauxhall Cavalier. Registration number D745RWJ. Now, I'd also like to speak to this woman, Doreen Williams, who we believe could help us with information about this man. So if you know either of them, or where they are, ring us now. Finally, can you help us find a mystery camper who disappeared in June? He left these behind in a field in Hale near Penzance in Cornwall. Local police, concerned for his safety, mounted a helicopter search but found no one. There are no real clues to his identity. He must be used to camping, though, because everything was packed into just these three bags. Maybe this bike with the customised saddle or this book with Chadwell St Mary Christian Fellowship might look familiar. This old-fashioned engineer's mallet with marks on the handle here and here might also be a clue. We know someone cooked a meal using these just before the 13th of June. So if you're the mystery camper or you recognise anything here, call us now. If you can provide any possible new lead, no matter how small it may seem, please do ring 01 811 8055. That's 01 811 8055. On Thursday morning, about a month ago, there was a terrifying raid at the central station in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. It was one of those events which can turn mild people into heroes, and as you'll see, a security guard acted with extraordinary courage. In the reconstruction that follows, actors or stand-ins play all the principal roles. The major crime, as so often happens, was made possible by a minor one some time before, in this case on a summer's evening in Newcastle's West End. It's 9pm on Tuesday the 14th of July. Michael McGarty, a joiner, was celebrating the completion of a contract. His celebrations had lasted for over a week. The police were called, but someone got there first. The thief made off with a birth certificate, 30 pounds in cash, and McGarty's driving license. Two months later, it's Tuesday the 8th of September. At the Northumbria filling station in Wall's End, a man with a Geordie accent wanted to hire a van. The driving license was in the name of Michael John McGarty. He hired a brand new white Sherpa van and the agreement was for two days up to Thursday, September the 10th. Within half an hour, a similar man using the same license was at the town and country car rental company, also in Wall's End. This time he hired an e-registered white Sierra. NCP records reveal the Sierra was in the Green Market car park on that Tuesday night. But where was the Sherpa van? Good morning, the age of clock to Middlesbrough will depart from platform seven. It's Thursday the 10th of September at Newcastle Central Station. 
be Middlesbrough. Platform 7 for the eight Thursday is wages day for BR staff, and the wages office is tucked away off platform 14 in an area not open to the public. By 8 o'clock that morning, a Securicor van was on its way to the station, delivering the week's wages. At about the same time, an E-registered white Sierra was in Blandford Street, about half a mile from Central Station. It's 8.20 a.m. The first delivery before the wages was 14 bags of coin to the station's travel centre. At about this time, a Sherpa van was seen in the parcels collection area called the West End Dock, close to platform 14. Meanwhile, the security guard made further trips to and from the travel center, collecting boxes of notes. By 8.30, the Securicor van was moving round through the parcels dock to the wages office on platform 14. Scotswood Road, the van turned into Churchill Street. This is Blenheim Street at the junction where it meets Churchill Street. Two cars were waiting to turn right. There is one more important sighting. At nine o'clock, the Sierra was being dumped in Lady Kirk Road. By now, there was just one man in the car. Lady Kirk Road is about a mile from where the driving license had been stolen two months before. The detective in charge of the case is Detective Inspector Morris King of British Transport Police. There's quite a handsome reward in this case, isn't there? That is correct, yes. Security Corps are offering £5,000 for any information leading to the apprehension and conviction of the criminals. Well, I'm pretty sure there'll be people watching this programme who know exactly who they are. A simple phone call can make them 5000 quid. Let's, let's help them along. We've got video fits of uh, the, the two people who actually attacked the... Uh, the um, security corps man. This is the man with a gun, he balding, as you can see. He had a beer belly. He was the guy with the shotgun, wasn't he? That is correct, yes. Uh, the man with the uh, wig and uh, spectacles that came off during the, the um, struggle, he's short in his 20s to 30s, stocky build. <clears throat> We've got the, the specs of the wig here, though uh, nothing very spectacular or descriptive about them. 
The man who stole the, the wallet from the man who was drunk, he was also fairly small. Uh, conceivably, he was the same man as was involved in, in the raid. Uh, here's a photo fit of him, short, five foot five, scruffy, 40th. And we've got uh, descriptions, too, of the van and the car. Now, what do you want to know, principally, about these vehicles? The vehicles were hired on the Tuesday. We wish to know where they were between the Tuesday and the Thursday, the day of the robbery. Right, well, there's the van, E820 ATN, and the Sierra, white Sierra, also E registered, E409 VW. And, of course, where did the three men get out of that car before it was parked in Lady Kirk Road? Not just £5,000 reward. We should bear in mind that these men are really quite dangerous. That, that is true, yes. It was a very daring raid with a degree of violence used. The security, the security corps man could have been badly in, injured, as well as a shotgun being used also. The £5,000 reward put up by security corps is there for our assistance and to help us catch these criminals. Well, uh, if you want that reward, if there's any way that you can uh, help, the number to ring is 018118055, or you can phone the Transport Police at Newcastle upon Tyne Railway Station. That's 091, the code for Newcastle, 2611234, and ask to be put through to the police incident room. Well, now to photo call, television's version of the wanted poster. Suspects caught on photo, film, or video. With the details, here are David Hatcher and Helen Phelps. First, we want to catch three men seen here on Tuesday the 28th of April. They're attempting to rob the NatWest Bank on the North Circular in Neasden, North London. Two of the men were armed with sawn-off shotguns and they held a customer at gunpoint on the floor while staff hid behind their counters. Despite the man's plea to cashiers to give the gunmen what they wanted, no money was handed over and they eventually left empty-handed. These two photographed particularly well and although all three were thought to have London accents, they could come from anywhere in the southeast. If you know these men, ring us now. This man was snapped on July the 10th by a quick-thinking publican who saw him trying to break into the cellar of a pub in Barnet, North London. He was even obliging enough to turn and face the camera. He's described as 20 years old, 5 foot 11 tall and of slim build. He left behind this jacket with a distinctive label called appropriately Sticky Fingers. If you think you know him, call us now. This man has just tried to cash a £360 cheque at a bank in Castleford, West Yorkshire. He and another man had talked an elderly lady into paying in advance to mend a loose floorboard. But the bank clerk knew the lady and refused to cash the cheque. He's about 27, 5'4 to 5'6, with blonde hair and a broken front tooth. And lastly, on April the 1st, this man drew out £3,000 from a building society in Widnes, Cheshire, and another £1,000 from the same branch five days later. Nothing suspicious about this, except that we now know that the £12,500 cheque used to open the account was stolen, and nearly all the funds have now been withdrawn. Take a closer look at him. He's about 40, with wavy brown hair and a fresh complexion. Ring us now if you know who he is, or if you can help with any of our other photo call faces. The number is always 018118055. Your call, of course, will be in confidence, 018118055. I've just heard that uh, a viewer in Hampshire thinks that uh, he or she has found the keys that belong to Wendy Nell. The police are right now checking those out and uh, will bring you news as it develops soon. Over the past five years, police in the Notting Hill area of West London have been trying to track down a man who's assaulted and raped at least eight women in their homes. As you'll see in our film in a moment, the attacks are linked by several small but vital clues which maybe somebody tonight might put together and recognise. Notting Hill is one of London's most famous areas with its annual carnival and wide tree-lined streets and large elegant houses. But since 1982, it's become renowned for another reason. One of the victims has allowed us to employ an actress to describe what happened using her exact words from her statement to police. It's what you read about, isn't it? I mean, it's always someone else. You never think... When it happened, all I could think about was my parents. I just wanted to be with them at home. At least eight women so far have been attacked, and the assaults have not been at random. 
All of them have taken place inside the victims' own homes, mostly basement flats backing onto communal gardens. And they've all been within just half a mile of each other. There were five incidents in 1982 and one in 1983. Then a four-year break until this year, a rape last May and then another in July, and the police are certain it's the same man. Leading the investigations is Detective Superintendent Jim Hutchinson. He's certainly become more professional and ruthless than he was before. However, he does leave clues and we're building up a reasonable picture of him. Uh, firstly, there's a way he operates. Often his victims come home late at night after having been out for the evening. I've been to a party. I suppose I got home about 1.30 in the morning. Did anyone come home with you? Yes, my boyfriend. He gave me a lift, but he didn't come in. He waited, though, till I let myself in. What happened then? I went into the living room and tried to turn on the light. It didn't come on. Suddenly, the door moved. Who's that? I knew you. I've been watching you. Do not scream. Shut up. Where is your money? On each occasion, he pretends to be a burglar, but there's little doubt that rape is his motive. He's meticulous in his uh, preparation. He obviously selects his victim beforehand and uh, watches her for some time because he's able to relate things that she has done and said. And then there's his voice. His voice is somewhat distinctive. Scream! Shut up! Where is your money? Where is your money? Do you not scream? You see, he doesn't use abbreviations. For instance, he says, do not scream, as opposed to don't scream. His voice has no real accent to it at all, but it's soft, but there's an air of authority about his voice, and he controls his victims thoroughly with it. Do not look or I will hurt you, understand? I won't look, I promise you I won't look. He then had in his hand some kind of tie or scarf, I couldn't say what. He stood behind me and tied it around my eyes as a blindfold. He tied it tight. I couldn't see anything from that moment on. This material here is sheeting which he took in uh, to tie up his victims. To the naked eye, it appears to be the same. However, uh, on examination, we're able to say that one of the materials was manufactured prior to 1982 in this country, whilst the other was probably manufactured in Belgium or Germany, and we're following up that lead at the present moment. This slip also was taken in by him to tie up one of his victims. Now, it's a size 40 Marks and Spencer's full-length slip, and we believe it was on sale in Marks and Spencer's stores about 1978-79. The seams have been uh, split and repaired with cotton. On one side, there's a white cotton, and on the other side, there's a dark gray cotton. This thread is at least 20 years old, so perhaps it belongs to an elderly person. At one of the rapes, we found on a number of photographs that he had strewn across the floor that he had left footmarks, and we were able to put those footmarks together into a composite and get a sole. Now, these soles were affixed to shoes or indeed casual boots, manufactured in uh, 1986 and put on to Pepe and Rico casual boots or indeed casual shoes. In most of the attacks, the man has been carrying a weapon. He drew a knife across my throat and then pushed me in the back. We moved forward and I realized he was taking me into the bedroom. When I felt the blade run along my throat, I knew one way or another I was going to be raped. To add to the forensic evidence, the police have brought in an applied psychologist who's come up with a criminal profile which might give at least some insight into the kind of man they're looking for. In our research, we have looked at, at a variety of different types of rapes. And this individual is somewhat unusual in the degree of planning um, that he puts into these attacks. He would appear to be very emotionally controlled. He keeps his feelings very much to himself. But he's also confused about his emotions and about his relationships to women, because after these violent attacks on them, 
um, that are dealt with in a very instructive and uh, demanding sort of way, he will then try and indicate that there's some sort of emotional relationship there. He therefore would appear to be somebody who finds it very difficult to form lasting relationships with a woman of the same age. Indeed, he sees them as, as objects rather than as people that he's trying to relate to. But it's also likely that in his relationships with other people, he's very cold and aloof and, and is seen as the sort of person who it's difficult to, to understand or to get to know properly. Although the attacks have been concentrated within this one small area, police are not ruling out the possibility that the man may come from anywhere in the country. The well, WDC Carol Lorigan is one of the officers working on the case. Do you think he is a local man, in fact? I don't think we can definitely say that he is living locally, but he does have a broad knowledge of the area, and he, he certainly should have some association, either has lived or worked in the area. Do you think there are more women who might have been attacked by this man in that area? We believe that there are women who have been raped and assaulted by this man, and for whatever reason, they've been too frightened to report it. Perhaps some women are frightened to report it because they fear the ordeal of going through the events all over again and perhaps they fear that the police won't be sensitive or understanding enough. Times have changed, attitudes have changed. We are very sympathetic and understanding. We have female officers who have been trained and are very experienced in dealing with these matters. We have victim support centres where they can go and talk informally. So they genuinely will get a much more confidential and much more sensitive response? Yes, certainly they will. How important is it, would you say, for other women to come forward to help you find this man? It is extremely important. This man is dangerous and he is sick. And if he isn't caught, he will strike again. If there are any women out there, I would ask them to ring us now. We need to know about this man and tell us your experiences. They may have some clue that will lead to his identity. Mm, could be absolutely vital. How do you account, in fact, for that apparent four-year gap between 1982 and May this year, when apparently there were no attacks by him? It's very difficult to say exactly what has happened to him during that four years. It may be that he's, he struck up a stable relationship during that period. He may have been in prison, he may have been working abroad with the services or another company. It may have been that he, he has attacked during that time, but it hasn't been reported. We, that's why we need to hear from people. Right. That applied psychologist you brought in can only speculate, of course, really. Would you add anything to that description of him? No, I think um, we all believe it's very similar to that, um, that he is a loner and that he has some female domination in his life. Do you have any advice to offer to women who live in the Notting Hill area or indeed anywhere who feel the need to protect themselves? It is very, very important that they are cautious and wary they must make sure that their doors and windows are bolted, that they're ever so secure. They must make sure their curtains are drawn at night, and when they go out, they must leave a light on. If it's off when they come home, call for some assistance. Call the police. We're quite happy to. So far, people aren't taking notice of our warnings. Finally, could we recap on the details of the description we do know about him so far? He's white. He's five foot six to five foot ten. He's aged 25 to 35 years. He's slim, athletic build, he has neat brown, wavy hair, he's clean shaven and he has no accent. Right, well, that's quite a broad description, perhaps somebody can add to that tonight. Carol, thank you very much indeed. If you can help in any way, particularly if you live near the Notting Hill area and you've been attacked over the last five years, we do know now how important it is that you come forward. Or if you recognised any of those items that we've shown you in the film, the shoes or boots with those soles, they're Rico or Pepe, they're size 9, or the slip, or the pieces of sheeting, or also the yellow Sainsbury's kitchen gloves, size 7.5, which he wore on the last attack. Now, if you recognise any of those items, please do ring us now. The number is 01 8055. You can speak to a woman or a, a BBC researcher or a detective, all in the strictest confidence. Or if you prefer, you can call the Incident Room at Notting Hill, and that number is 01 6021. That's 741 6021. If you're not on the phone, you can write to us at Crime Watch UK, BBC TV, London W12 8QT, or of course you can just contact your local police. The phone numbers for the Incident Rooms are on CFAX on page 186.
And that's all for this month. Remember that our new regular day now is Tuesday, the second Tuesday of the month, so we'll be back on November the 10th. Before that, of course, we have our update in just under an hour's time. And if you can't catch that, we'll give you all the latest news on open air tomorrow morning at about a quarter to 12. Do remember, though, that although Crime Watch does cover frightening crimes, like the ones we've talked about tonight, where women have been attacked in their homes, they really are very rare. In fact, if it's any consolation, actually the chances against something like that happening tonight to any individual Crime Watch viewer run into literally many millions to one. But do please take sensible precautions. By way of comparison, though, watch out for a new crime prevention campaign that starts tomorrow. It's about a crime that, by contrast, most of us take too lightly, drinking and driving. That kills more than twice as many people as all other crimes put together. And it's one that we certainly can do something about. Sleep well. Good night. Good night.